Okay. Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, this is part 19 of our series on libraries in response or what is a library if the building is closed. Uh, we started these in late March. Uh, they became pretty regular uh, on almost every Friday since then. Um, as I said, this is number 19. Uh, I saw this, uh, and I'm, I'm wearing a mask, I think I'm on video here, uh, that this is the governor of Wisconsin asking all the employees to uh, mask up for their online conferences, which, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but then you think about it and it's, it's not designed to physically protect people, but to communicate that mask wearing is, you know, okay. All right, so it's okay, but. I don't have to. I don't feel like I have to anyway. Uh, stop share. Um, so we are. Yep. We are uh, in the process here of. Uh, reviewing things that have happened. We have uh, a couple of exciting new uh, guests with us today, uh, very different sort of perspectives like we normally do. Uh, our, our guests sometimes are in related areas, sometimes not. I mean, other than the fact that everybody that, that comes to these has some kind of interest in libraries, public libraries mainly, but school academic libraries, we've had presentations. Uh, from all of those, and uh, I hope you were here for the last week. It was it was an exciting session. Um, so let me return to screen share here and set up the uh, slides. So. Um, Libraries in response. Uh, we this is a slight change of the topic or the title. What is a gigabit library if a building is closed? Uh, we're the Gigabit Libraries Network, but there's a toolkit that we're going to hear about uh, today uh, uh, on how to attain, you know, uh, gigabit status. This is a this is a goal that we initiated in 2007. Uh, fiber to the library, that every library should be uh, intermediate endpoint on a uh, gigabit fiber network. That is to say, an endpoint, a priority point where tens of millions of people access the internet through a library, and also as a way to deliver the infrastructure deeper into communities, into markets for interconnect, possible uh, interconnect to extend the last mile to homes and offices in, in the community as a, as a as a dual use or as a, a double value for uh, spending a very small comparative amount of money to connect these 16 something thousand facilities. Uh, that's gone on, ALA picked that up. They were a sponsor of that uh, initial workshop in, in 2007, uh, wrote a pamphlet and it's, it's uh, of course moved forward more or less, but you know, not fast enough, we're not there yet. So we're going to hear about uh, what's the latest. Uh, we have the team that built this uh, toolkit uh, out of a grant with, uh, from IMLS and in partnership with Internet2. Internet2 being the national backbone network that connects all the state research and education networks. And these are really the people that built the first generation uh, of the internet, uh, the universities, and then they set up these state agencies to connect themselves and then they began to connect other anchor institutions, colleges, libraries, schools, clinics, and so forth. Uh, it's been a remarkable evolution. I believe they have around a quarter of a million facilities connected to the, to the state networks now. So this is a really interesting project uh, and has just, as I understand, won a new uh, grant from IMLS. We're gonna hear something about that today. 
we are the UBIT Libraries Network, open collaboration, you know, uh, libraries sharing information, strategies, and doing projects. Most of our projects have been around uh, the use of wireless, which we'll get into here as we think it uh, pertains to the, to the subject. Uh, uh, we have Carson Block, uh, Carson Block Consulting, who's going to tell us about this, uh, this project. And we're also privileged to have uh, uh, Bruno Duarte Iris, if I've said that right, Bruno, I hope, uh, the Director of Library Services at the Directorate General for Books, Archives, and Libraries in Portugal. And um, this brings us back home to the rarely asked question, is our children learning? Uh, this is kind of the number one topic is, is how are we able to do school in this environment? It doesn't seem like we are able to do it. It's the most chaotic thing uh, that anybody has imagined. The people are going, should I, should I not? How can I, how can I not? Uh, it, it's just an, a horrible dilemma. And so we hope you're all thinking about how you can uh, support learning in your community, how you can support students at home, how you can support parents who are supporting students at home, which seems to be one of the big, uh, uh, demands of libraries today. It's not the only one. This, the pandemic is our overriding uh, crisis of the moment. I, I could say that, I suppose. Uh, but it's it's in the context of these ongoing uh, other crises like climate change, planetary warming. And you can see here that uh, weather-driven events, uh, disaster events are increasing uh, pretty dramatically here. Uh, so be prepared for that. It, just because you're in a lockdown doesn't mean that the hurricane is not going to blow through. We just had one, as I'm sure some of you may have experienced in the, in the middle of the country. This uh, Dereco, I think they call it, uh, blew through at 100 miles an hour up, up the central part of, uh, of the country and devastated a large part of the Iowa corn crop. Uh, this, is, this is still early. This stuff is just going to be more severe and they're going to be more, more frequent. So how libraries as second responders play a role in that is, is a big question. It's shelters, of course, but also as communication information sources and having a backup communications plan is what we think uh, everybody should be thinking about. I, I wanna just roll out a, a concept here uh, uh, that we're thinking about. We'll see if anybody has anything to say about it or think about it, respond, but this is the idea of universal public access. So we know we're not gonna connect everybody at home anytime soon or very soon, but there's no reason that we can't provide connectivity to everyone, at least proximate to where they are. You know, Some easy walking distance, let's say, or maybe driving distance to access a, uh, a point of entry into the internet as kind of the baseline absolute guarantee that government basically owes its citizens is access to public information, public services, more and more of which are only digital. And uh, so think of kind of a public phone and emergency call box and a, a e-government kiosk and, and good old library Wi-Fi, which is an entry point or a portal, if you will, to not only library digital services and the open internet, but librarians and, and other, uh, other public resources. So that's an idea we'll be talking about more. But today, uh, we're gonna get to our speakers here. And first up is uh, Bruno from, uh, from Portugal. So uh, he's gonna tell us what's going on there and how libraries are coping and, and uh, uh, what he sees coming up next. So uh, with that, I will stop share and turn it over to you, Bruno. Thank you. Hi, Don. Thank you. And thank you for this invitation as well. It's a pleasure to be here to see so much colleagues attending and so much friends also. Um, my name is Bruno Weires. I'm a librarian uh, just that just a few years ago started an adventure working at the Ministry of Culture. Um, I work all my life in public libraries, in front desk, in projects, in um, developing skills with the community. But a few years ago, 
I uh, start this uh, adventure in the Ministry of Culture, uh, embracing a new challenge on a more bureaucratic and more national uh, approach to libraries. Um, regarding the presentation for today, I will. Um, yes, Don. Can I interrupt and, and ask you to yeah. describe the Ministry of Culture? Uh, this is a <laughs> in the U.S. You know, we think of culture as, as Levi's and Coca-Cola and Hollywood, but that's not, the, that's not the way the other rest of the world thinks about culture. Would you kind of give us a context for the Ministry of Culture and the library inside of that? Sorry okay. to interrupt. No, it, it, it's fine. Um, well, in Portugal, we have a Ministry of Culture for quite a while after the um, rev revolution in the 70s. And the Ministry of Culture is a ministry where all the uh, patrimonial and monuments and arche archaeological things are, and also the parts between, uh, related to libraries, only public libraries, uh, school libraries and academic libraries belong to different ministry, uh, archives and books. Um, it's sometimes it's strange when you look at the structure of the ministry because we have all the cultural, typical traditional culture um, stuff, uh, museums, uh, more uh, patrimonial documents, more world heritage uh, work. But you have also the part where I work, it's the general directorate for books, um, archives and libraries where we do um, a lot of work related more to the community, more to the society, but even so we belong to the Ministry of, of Culture. Most of the times um, we have um, like a, a clash of interest be between the more patrimonial aspects of uh, traditional culture, but um, I think that since the, a few years ago, we managed to put together and to bring together with a more integrated approach related to the more, the more monumental traditional cultural approach to the society and to citizens, yeah. Great, thanks so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So let's start uh, this presentation with a screen sharing. Let me see. Uh, can you please enable my screen sharing, Don, please? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, let me see if it's working. Yeah, it's working. Okay, Dan, can you please confirm me if you see okay. my screen sharing? Yeah? Yep. Okay. It's, yeah, there you go. It's not in play mode, but there we go. Good. Uh, okay, thanks. So, um, uh, the, the first cases of COVID-19 appear in Portugal at the um, middle of February and around the middle of March, we are on lockdown, complete and total lockdown. Here at the Ministry of Culture and at the General Directorate, on between a Friday and a Monday morning, we try to put up a, a program and a strategy that we called uh, in English, let's go libraries, in Portuguese, vamos a isso, uh, bibliotecas, and we uh, designed this uh, logo, this uh, banner that we use on all of our um, work with the libraries since the lockdown. If, if you look back, we started the lockdown on a Friday, between a Friday and a Monday. So most of the public services don't have any time to organize or to arrange an approach and a strategy in order to help um, citizens or in our case, to help libraries. So between the, the first week, all of this was put up with the most uh, personal and uh, informal approach and uh, it's not easy. Uh, in order for you to understand better what is the public library network in Portugal, the program of the National Library Network started in 1987 with a national program to, uh, that has that have the aim 
to uh, build and to support the building of a library in all the municipalities. Portugal have 308 muni municipalities. At this time, this is the map of Portugal and it's divided in the municipalities and all the blue uh, territories are the ones that have um, a, pu a public library supported and or built by the national program and the white territories, the white municipalities are the ones who still have a public library but until now they don't follow the minimum require requirements that we decided. For the all 308 municipalities in Portugal, only five don't have any kind of public libraries. So at this at these these days, we have 239 municipalities uh, put together on the national library network, that um, with a total of 409. Uh, public libraries with central libraries, of course, and also branches. Our national program for public libraries is well known even abroad for the uh, architectural aspect. Um, it was a demand of the project during the, the 80s in the 12th century, in the 18th century, in the 20th century, sorry. Um, that all the new buildings, all the new library buildings must have a very nice and very uh, demanding architectural aspect. This is one from uh, Ilhav Public Library in north part of Portugal that is a project that was distinguished, distinguished with an award on a conference of architects in Chicago a few years ago and um, it's one of our most interesting architectural buildings. But we don't we don't we are not here to talk about buildings this this is was was just for you to understand better the situation of libraries in portugal we are here to talk about uh, impacts situation of public libraries after the pandemic as you may understand for a country like portugal with the dimension of our country um and even so, we have a, a national program for public libraries for the last three decades. Most of our services are still uh, very tra traditional and based on borrowing books um, and all the reading promotion, traditional reading promotion services. Even so, we have, of course, some points around the country where there are libraries that are make, making um, a very progressive and innovative um, projects. This is an, an example of one of the materials that we here at the General Directorate made in March, is a chart that we uh, put up on that crazy and rush week of March in order to try to uh, help libraries and, li and librarians to prepare a response to their communities and try to guide them in some uh, in some ways. Of course, and I'm sorry for that, the chart is in Portuguese, but I can summarize it quickly. The title is Public Libraries Facing COVID-19 Pandemic. And then around this circle, we have written what is the role of public libraries in this and around the circle we try to put up the most important things that libraries can can do like i was saying for a most traditional libraries and library services that we have here in portugal and it was very important on the first month of the lockdown and, all, and of the, pan, the pandemic, try to guide and try to uh, identify some ways, some guidance that we can give, give to libraries and to librarians in order not them to stop uh, totally. And we have a lockdown, a total and complete lo lockdown since March the 12th until the end of April. Uh, only starting uh, in the beginning of May, uh, we have um, government authorization in order to open some of the e equipments. And for coincidence or not, libraries were the first equipments that the state authorized to open. On May the 3rd, uh, libraries can be open to the public. Um, one of the characteristics that we have in Portugal is that besides all the efforts that the librarians do, and we have a very well 
uh, trained um, librarians and very engaged librarians with the, with our communities. We we have a, a specification. Uh, we are now the only uh, European country that all, that don't have a, a national platform with, con with on online content. We have. Um, national platforms for world heritage um, documentation and contents. The national libraries have one. Of course, our national archives have one too. But we don't have a national or regional platforms, for instance, with ebooks, with audiobooks, or um, movies in, 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 with streaming. So on the first weeks of March, one of our um, most challenging uh, jobs was to using uh, the Flipboard, the, the free online solution for um, the, um, information curation, to try to put up the most important and most relevant uh, online content that we find and make them available to libraries in order for the libraries have selected and validated content that that they can share and they ca that they can work with in order to try to establish some kind of service for the libraries and this is a very interesting experience that we have because during um, probably three or four months we we arranged to create some co collaborative uh, work with the librarians and with libraries and even with with the civil society because we received from librarians from uh, anonymous citizens um, suggestions suggestions and uh, links to online content free and legal of course online content that we we have find and we put all the resources on this uh, Flipboard solution. And it was very, very helpful for libraries during the first weeks and specifically during the, log the lockdown in order to help them to establish some kind of information to users. Uh, of course, in April, when, when the conversation tried to uh, lead us in try to find some kind of guidance to reopen libraries, um, we at the general directorate tried to uh, put up some guidance, some uh, guidelines, some orientations for public libraries. This is the first document that we made on the middle of April, tried to uh, define some guidelines for public libraries that they can um, use documents and they, that they can that they can start to managing some kind of lending documents. Of course, we used all the information that we find available from the United Kingdom, of course, from our colleagues from the US, and we put up some um, rules and regulations and orientations to help libraries on uh, restarting to um, putting a, put, put in, in order um, a lending service for uh, library documents. A few weeks later, we uh, gathered the best practices that we find from Portugal, but also from around the world. And we, um, we edit another document with recommendations with the best practices on reopening libraries from, the, of course, the public libraries network. And this, this, uh, this was the document that most of the libraries use, not only for public libraries, but also for school and academic libraries. It can, like you can imagine, it was a document that took several nights to put, <laughs> to, put uh, to, to, to put to the public, but uh, we are very proud of the, the result that we managed. Of course, we have many help from colleagues from another, from different countries, especially from Europe. And it became um, a very useful uh, document for libraries on the reopening uh, of the public libraries starting uh, May the 3rd. Of course, we are, and we know that that most of our libraries uh, do a very traditional approach. But we have also libraries that can and that uh, could, during the lockdown, start a very innovative services. This is an example from um, Pombal Public Library in the center of Portugal, 
and they have a 3D printing. And uh, on the first days after the lockdown, they partnerships with the partnership with the uh, National Association of Maker Spaces, and in a few days they starting. Uh, they start uh, cooperating with this association, help them to produce any kind you can imagine of equipment, of protection equipment that they can do on um, a print machine. Uh, of course, also another library from Alcubasa, the Alcubasa Public Library also have uh, two 3D printers and tried to help this uh, Makerspace Association printing um, protecting uh, services. And then we have a boom in a country where most of the libraries have very traditional services. In different parts of the country, we assist that libraries are um, aware of the community needs and try to develop creative uh, lending services or printing services to the community. This is an example from Erganil Public Library um, when the, the library staff uh, are very um, are very uh, concerning about to have the library closed for more than a month at that at that time and they create a way in order to start lending uh, documents uh, to the community they contact the local health health authority and they try to establish with our help some kind of um, rules some kind of orientation guidelines in order to they can make some services to the community and uh, after this library around the country, we have libraries making takeaway borrowing services, curbside pick up, pick up books, and it was quite popular. So popular that the uh, national television and other cable channels try, start to making some um, some coverage of the services and uh, at the end of March, beginning of April, we have a total of 15 libraries around the country that were concerned for being closed and start making a takeaway, um, a curbside services and we even have a library, the um, Camp Rio Maior Public Library, that because of the architectural of the library um, allow that, they develop an, a book drive services. The users can pass on the, near the front door of the library and through the door and through the windows of the library, it was possible to give up the, to give the documents to the users. It was a very popular on the media here in Portugal, the first library that have a book drive uh, services um, available at, the, at that time. And after that, uh, around the country, libraries were awaking. Libraries were, um, were more concerned about being closed for such quite a while at this, this time and try to understand that uh, they can no longer um, pretend that the technology was an option. They can no longer pretend that the traditional services was the only way to make the services. And we assist on during the, the month of April and May uh, through uh, awakening of libraries and librarians in, in Portugal. From all over the country, we receive notices from um, libraries that have, have transformed their uh, reading clubs, uh, physical reading clubs, on online reading clubs. I imagine for the most of the colleagues in US, this is this was a very simple and easy easy way. But until April this year, we don't have an online uh, real and through online um, read, reading club. It was after the during the lockdown and after the reopening that the libraries um, have taken conscience that they can no longer pretend that technology was an, an option and they need to use technology in order to make through useful services for the community. This is another example from the Pombal Public Libraries. They work, they have a very nice relations with the school libraries and when the schools start to reopen and uh, online uh, school of course, uh, they uh, articulate the, the programs and the hours where they are going to do some online activities and they related them with the end of the, 
the school. When the school time ends, the library is starting to put up some activities related to the libraries. And in each, in each day, they have a different kind of offer for different kind of um, audience, for different kind of, of users. Of course, most of these uh, activities are for children because they are an example of the way that the public libraries work with the school libraries. And this is an example of the first through and real online uh, reading club that we have in Portugal is from the uh, it's a regional network that we support here in Portugal. It's the uh, OEST, the West uh, International Network of, li of, of Libraries, and this is an example of the first online um, uh, reading club that we can put up in Portugal through um, the month of April. And then all over the country, we assist um, some innovations and some unexpected movements tried to increase, it, tried to grow in different parts. There was, we received so much feedback from the libraries that we start to collect images from all over the country. We have um, a Flickr account with examples from our uh, beautiful architectural buildings, but we are now using the Flickr account also to collect examples from all over the country uh, in order to record the reopening of libraries. My favorite is this photograph from Ancien Public Libraries. This is the first day, the first hour, the first, I don't know if it, if it was the first minute when the library opened, but this is a father and a son returning, getting back to the library after almost three, two months of, of closing and they are really, really happy in order to uh, are able to come back to, to the library. This is a, a, very, a very nice uh, moment to remember um, after. And That's of great. course, uh, Rill, yes, can sorry. You, can, you, can you close in a couple of minutes? Yeah, to yeah, certain one. Yes, oh, of course, sorry. Uh, and this is another example from, of course, one of our mobile libraries in order to outreach the, um, uh, the community outside the, the, the city centers. A more creative way in order for the library to uh, give access to books with a basket through a balcony with a rope. And of course, with all the concerns about uh, hygiene and quarantine books in order to maintain the, um, sec the secure information with the users. Another example from another library when the day when they reopen and welcome all the users and all the community to the public library. This is a report that we are going to um, put uh, on, the, on the web just after this web webinar. On the last three weeks, we managed to do um, an inquiry to public libraries that belong to the public library network about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on public libraries. We question around 10 questions for libraries to answer in order to try to make um, a state of the art, how libraries are function now and in what ways they can uh, predict how the future uh, is going to be. To conclude, just three points of the most positive things that I think that the pandemic brought to us and of course the three uh, most concerning things. The three most optimistic things are the new opportunities that the pandemic brought to us and uh, through national conscience that we need to rethink about the library services. Uh, like I've said previously, of course, the new services and activities that the libraries have to be creative and manage it to put up. And of course, all the collaborative and partnership work that the pandemic brought to us. For the other side, the most concerning three, three top topics are um, the conscience also that the library staff have a very low digital skills that we need to improve quickly and some of the IT problems that some of the libraries also have. We have to realize that on the national general national state of the art most of the library presence is um, quite reduced and we have several problems on users and related to the uh, usability of the uh, library web, web presence. And of course, like I started saying, uh, we need to solve these 
absence of online content and resources to uh, libraries can do a, a better job. Uh, Ending with these two questions, the mo our most concerning um, uh, idea for the future is if the library community is in Portugal are going to stay and continue continuing going uh, front and try to create more innovative, more creative solutions, or after the COVID-19 pandemic uh, passes, if we are going back to the old days and going back to our comfort zone, and um, all this uh, learning process will be uh, we, we, we will not be uh, useful for uh, the future. Of course, we are very very focused on uh, opening and helping libraries in order for them to go uh, to stay and continue like like this. Uh, just a final re remarks: If you want to know more about public libraries in Europe, uh, you can visit the Naples Forum. The Naples Forum is an organization that put together information about national authorities on public libraries in Europe. These are the two reports that we made, one on April 30 and the other update on July 15. And at the, the bottom of the screen, you have the link um, if, in order for you to know more about the public library situation in Europe. Thank you for your time. Uh, like we say in Portuguese, muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Really You're fascinating. Um, so a couple of questions. One, uh, is your PowerPoint online anywhere that you could provide a link? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and then Daniel asks a link to your Flickr account. If you could put those in the chat, that would be okay. great. Yeah, yeah, in a minute. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about asking presenters to provide a, a link to their slides as opposed to trying to pass them around by emails. But just a lot of really interesting stuff you brought up. Uh, other questions uh, from people? The, the points you made about collaborating with the schools is just an outstanding. I, I've never heard that, that, you know, after school, of course, Kids have traditionally gone to libraries after school, but but now you know online to coordinate so that you're providing resources to support yeah. students at that hour is is really fascinating. Um, how how do the libraries actually link up or talk to or collaborate with the schools? What's the what's the mechanism for that? Okay, in Portugal, uh, aside the public library network, we have a national school library network. And the organization of the school library network is um, uh, with region. They have regional um, school librarians that manage all the region through on with the relation between the school library and the the, the public library. So it's quite easy when the library wants to cooperate with the school library. Of course, because they are municipal, also like the public library, the school libraries uh, have a municipal. Uh, organization but if the if the, the the public library don't want to talk to every each of the schools they can only contact the responsible the school librarian that is responsible for their region and um, in a very easy way they can they can cooperate and work together that is so smart and so not the way we do it in the u.s um we may have some more questions, but I think we're going to move on to our okay. next presenter uh, in the interest of time. Uh, first, I want to uh, go back and introduce uh, our host, which I skipped over at the beginning, uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes, is hosting the Zoom and recording the Zoom. Uh, and Stephen Weiber is on and, and managing con the controls here from uh, from the Netherlands. Thanks again, Stephen and IFLA for that. And now we're up with uh, Carson Block, Carson Block Consulting to tell us about their new, their new IMLS grant uh, related to Toward a Gigabit Library, the toolkit that they created now, I guess two, three years ago and what's happening next. So Carson, uh, you are up. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here and such an honor to be among um, everyone that I see in the, in the list out there. Um, and Bruno, I wanted to say that I loved what you said about 
Um, uh, the idea that digital is no longer an option that you can ignore, um, that's something that, that uh, we've been uh, working on as well in, in the US because we realized that in, in the past, Everyone, including library people, could take or leave digital services, depending on their attitudes about it. Now, everyone knows that it's at least an option. So once this COVID thing is wrapped up, um, libraries need to be ready to get things going. And I also want to tell you um, that um, uh, my uh, uh, wonderful partner in this, uh, Stephanie Stenberg, is here. Stephanie, say hi. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thanks, <laughs> Stephanie. And Stephanie is the uh, Community Anchor Program uh, Director for Internet2. I'm Carson Block, uh, Carson Block Consulting. We'll do longer introductions another time. Uh, we also wanted to make note, though, of our founding team of our original grant, the Towards Gigabit Library Toolkit. Uh, James Worley, who unfortunately passed away uh, a couple years ago, and Susanna Spellman, who, is, uh, who went to the private sector. Um, uh, the three of us uh, formed the core of the team that put this thing together. Now I'm going to play a quick video for you because it tells you everything you need to know about this if you don't already. And it did not play the video. Isn't that nice? Um, let me go back and try that again. There we go. Welcome. This video is designed to give you an ultra quick overview of how to use the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. You'll be up and running in no time. The Toolkit is a free open source technology learning, diagnostic, and advocacy tool designed for public and tribal libraries in the U.S. But the Toolkit can be used just about anywhere in the world. The Toolkit will guide you through a series of questions about your technology environment and provides you with all the information you need to answer the questions. The Toolkit is an excellent way to diagnose and fix problems that you may be having with your library technology. Some libraries have found it especially useful in preparing for e-rate requests, budget cycles, and even in helping open up lines of communication between library staff and tech workers. Best of all, you do not need to be a techie to use the Toolkit. While it's always helpful to have someone with technical knowledge to assist, this toolkit was piloted with more than 60 rural and tribal libraries in 11 states to ensure that it is as simple as possible for you to use. The toolkit is divided into several key sections covering the types of technical challenges you're likely to encounter in your library and ways to solve those challenges. In the Technology Inventory section, you will find and understand some of the key pieces of the technology inside your library, including your network, computers, and other important technology components. This inventory will help you understand what sort of equipment you have now and provide a basis to determine if you need different or additional equipment for the future. In the Broadband Services and Activities section, the types of broadband services and applications are discussed in order to ensure that you have sufficient bandwidth to support patron and staff use of various devices and applications, both today and into the future. Technology in libraries is more than just a collection of gear. People, including library staff and those who provide technical support, are just as important. In the Broadband Technical Operations Support section, you will learn more about the people who help make technology available in your library and determine if there are any areas where you could benefit from additional support. Technology expenses are important budget considerations for all libraries. In the Broadband Funding section, you'll learn about several opportunities available to help provide funding for your library broadband connectivity. The topics listed in the Additional Resources and Best Practices section are designed to provide you even more insight and resources into improving your library's broadband connectivity and services. You may find these items helpful in gaining a better understanding of your broadband connection, data network, and computers. The toolkit also has a handy glossary section at the end for quick lookups of technical terms. And don't worry about completing the toolkit from end to end. It is designed to address the most common technology issues in libraries, so it does cover a lot of ground. You may need to only work through the sections that are the most important to you. After you've completed the toolkit, you can use another document called the Broadband Improvement Plan to create your own long-term and short-term strategies to improve your technology. Wondering how to find the toolkit materials? Everything is available at our website. The toolkit is free and open source. And if you like, you are free to use anything from the toolkit and mix it into other documents. This may be especially useful for state library organizations, rural and education networks, library consortiums, and others who would like to customize the toolkit materials. 
After you've used the toolkit and the broadband improvement plan, we would love to hear from you. Click on the link in the comments section of this video to share your experiences. Now, grab the toolkit and make it your own. And, and so what's really funny is that um, we were hoping to keep track of everyone who was using the toolkit through the, the voluntary sign up um, has never been hit, uh, but we know that it has been used so often. Now, uh, just quickly, as the video described in case uh, it did, didn't come through clearly, the goal of the toolkit was to do three things at the same time, to be an educational workbook, to be a self-assessment tool, but also to serve as an advocacy platform, because the more you know, the more you can do with it. Um, we, this is just a partial listing of the places we went, and I, I wanted to give shouts out uh, to Daniel Cornwall in Alaska, Dylan Baker in Idaho, Henry Stokes in Texas on the library side, and also Carolyn Coulter is on the, the call I see, which is awesome, um, and uh, r and &E partners as well. These are the rural and education uh, networks, uh, Jennifer Oxenford in uh, Pennsylvania and Tom Rolfs in Nebraska. Um, one of the things we were able to do with the toolkit visits is take this opportunity to put together the, uh, the reach that the state library organizations have with the technical expertise of r and &E partners. And that was um, especially um, uh, uh, demonstrated in Pennsylvania and in Nebraska. Uh, in fact, Tom has uh, just uh, done some amazing things there. Um, so what's going on today, Stephanie, with uh, this project? Let me share with you. We are so proud to announce we just received a new grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services um, for our project, which, um, which is about just under $250,000 to expand the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit and Broadband Improvement Plan. And we are obviously, um, you know, figuring out what that looks like in this uh, pandemic society we're all living in right now and um, how we can continue to um, improve upon the toolkit and help the most libraries. Um, we actually have, um, are putting together our advisory board, which we'll talk about in a second. That's right. So Don, sorry about the name. Um, <laughs> we, uh, and, and what's fun about this is we're all working for the same thing. Uh, we, we called it Beyond Gigabit Libraries because we want to be um, aspirational for our, our intent. And, and one of the definitions, um, as a consultant, I can say this, I don't care what the FCC calls broadband. With the libraries that I'm working with of all sizes, um, I, define, I define broadband as what is actually available to you in your community and what can you afford. Uh, considering E-rate. Um, and whatever that is, it does not equal enough probably for today, definitely not for tomorrow. So always looking ahead at future needs in different ways. And that's why uh, we're such fans of uh, Don's work uh, and all of the excellent projects that are going on to really uh, address these uh, connectivity things. Um, we were adding something new though um, uh, to our, uh, our, our stack. Uh, we, we reached out uh, to rural libraries and tribal libraries and we definitely need to make a much deeper reach into, into tribal. Um, uh, it got a great start, but there's so much more to do. Um, but we had this notion of tech deserts in urban areas that was uh, brought up in our, in our application process. And we were intrigued and we started digging in and we actually have a little toehold to find uh, more of this. So if you have any knowledge uh, about that, we want to hear from you because we want to, we know anecdotally that there are um, tech deserts, right, in, in urban areas, but it's harder uh, to find those. So if anyone in our, who are listening can connect us with resources on that, uh, we would love, uh, love to do that. So Stephanie, what else are we doing uh, with the toolkit here? Well, definitely scaling it up. Um, we're looking to expand, obviously, and help more rural and tribal libraries, as well as explore those tech deserts and urban areas. I think what makes this project so unique and so satisfying uh, to work on is just connecting those state libraries and people there with the people at, at research and education networks throughout the nation. Um, those partnerships through the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit Project were so valuable um, to the success of the toolkit that we're really looking forward to working with our partners again to make the toolkit even more accessible to more people. That's right. So everyone on the call, be ready. We're going to call on you again. Um, 
The uh, amazing thing about this is that we, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the original process on this, we didn't know if it would be possible actually to make a, uh, a technically oriented toolkit that a layperson, right? That's our, that's our, 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 our basic starter um, could take. And that would also pass the muster of, of more experienced technologists. So we took a completely uh, iterative and open approach to creating this with a lot of uh, a, a lot of partners uh, early and throughout. So it was a, 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 an exercise in continuous improvement and iteration to that toolkit, uh, even to small things, because we wanted it to be as accessible as possible. Um, the, I think the, 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 the proof of that, and I, I think the value of us just putting our heads down and working hard is that this has been adopted by so many uh, organizations. In fact, a lot that we don't know about. One of the things that we need to do as part of our kickoff is to try to inventory everywhere that this has been uh, used. Um, but um, uh, the organizations that you see here are, are, are some of the, uh, the, the folks who have just taken the ball and ran uh, with uh, this. And in fact, uh, right now I'm working with, uh, with Kimber um, using uh, aspects of the toolkit to do further uh, reach and education uh, with South Dakota next week. Um, uh, and, you know, even though the grant's been over, the initial grant's been over for a couple of years, I've been um, supporting it on my own time, uh, uh, you know, because we keep getting calls and it, it's just so wonderful to see how useful that it's been for folks. Definitely. And we were so fortunate to receive so many letters of support from our r and &E network partners, our state library partners, and various subject matter experts around the nation. Um, this is a list of some of the letters of support we received. Um, we were so grateful for it. Um, just thank you so much to everyone on the call. I know Carson gave everyone a shout out. Um, we really appreciate your support. Thanks. So our next step um, are some minor updates to the, the toolkit. Uh, as we all know, anything, anything that you put in print with technology is subject to have the freshness of fish, right? So um, uh, we were very careful about that in the original. We haven't had too much uh, link rot um, uh, there, but there's been a couple of things that do need to be updated. Uh, again, we're trying to inventory the number of libraries and organizations and other folks who have adopted the, the toolkit. Uh, so if you've done that, let us know, please. <laughs> we want to know. Uh, we also want to know what's worked well for, for the folks that, that's adopted it and what's been difficult. Um, and so these are our email addresses. Uh, if you're not familiar with us and, and you're intrigued by what's going on, just reach out. Uh, we would love to talk to you um, about anything. Uh, so yeah, also, we're, we're happy to answer any questions. That's great, uh, Carson, Stephanie, thank you. This is, this is terrific work. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, you know, your new, congratulations, by the way, on the IMLS grant. Um, so when you started this, I don't believe the pandemic had started, if, if I understand the scheduling, right? So it did happen in the middle of writing the grant or late in the grant. How did you modify the project to fit the reality of what's happening? It's funny you mentioned that. Um, all of our lives have turned to virtual only, right? So we've, we've had this pivot. And um, as a consultant with, with a, a, a diverse client group, um, with work that needed to be done. I had to figure out quickly how to um, do things that I used to do in person in a virtual format. Uh, so I've been able to pilot and try and fail and try again and succeed um, different ways to engage things. So uh, Stephanie and I right now are designing uh, our, our first thing that we're doing is convening again our, our, our subject matter experts and we'll be doing that in a virtual way but in a way that doesn't uh, give Zoom fatigue, something that's that's a lot more compelling than sitting around uh, staring at a screen, uh, which involves a multimodal uh, interaction, um, uh, just just uh, to, to mix things up and to keep, thing, keep people engaged. Um, we are watching things, though, because a big part of this is getting into the field and connecting with people. Um, if uh, COVID goes on longer than we think, uh, we will be ready to engage with uh, train the trainer sort of approach in a virtual way early on. Um, uh, and we'll be ready to switch to live in person times uh, when that's available. Interesting. Uh, it was quite a juggling process, I, I'm sure, as you had invested a lot in your original plan to modify it at, to, for what, right? Um, 
So uh, the question that comes to mind is, you know, the building is closed, right? Right. So what is the use of a gigabit to a closed library? I mean, okay, the router outside, yes, but how much of a gigabit do you need to support a hotspot in the parking lot? Well, you need more, right? Because that's my orientation and I'm sticking to it. You need more, whatever you have, you need more. Um, what's been happening, uh, and this hasn't part of the grant, but this is happening with my clients and, and Stephanie can, uh, is also seeing the same thing here and can speak to it. Um, one of the uh, techniques that I've been using that I encourage everyone else to use is that uh, we're in a reactive mode right now. And I am gonna answer your question, but this context is very important. We're in a reactive mode right now and it's forcing people into a habit of reactivity. Now, this time that we're having with COVID will be gone. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a valuable way or a valuable opportunity to learn what's been successful with our library services that have been pushed to the virtual platform and our digital infrastructures that we're using to supply those services. And so this is the time to make note and inventory of what's been working well and what, what's been successful and what has been failing and look ahead at the ways that we can um, uh, improve that. So when we're thinking about um, uh, 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 access just, I'm sorry, uh, a Wi-Fi, for instance, or that gigabit, just as access, you're right. It, it, it is, uh, oh, it's kind of hard to fill up a gig with, with uh, parking lot Wi-Fi. But if the library is serving uh, information out from its uh, next uh, network access points, uh, those uh, get, they, they get full. We need capacity. So I, I, I don't think that, I think that, that, that the networks and especially good functioning networks are more important now than ever. And Stephanie, I'm sorry, I've been asking all the questions because I'm like hyper. Uh, okay, I think, I think something the current state of affairs brings is um, opportunities to find funding and um, opportunities to really take those broadband improvement plans and run with them um, during these times. And so that's something we're going to be really focusing on and exploring. Uh, well, uh, it's kind of a loaded question, really, because uh, we've been, you know, looking at this and focused on it a long time. Uh, one of the responses is that the, the library is not isolated. It's part of its community and can be, as we say, an anchor in a wider network. So upgrading the library is a way to upgrade more or less everybody in the community or everybody has a potential to benefit from an upgrade in the infrastructure. That's uh, kind of a truism. The other is uh, what we've been uh, working on is using that surplus or that uh, impressive backhaul to wirelessly extend access to library services and the internet and so forth. Uh, but you, you have to have something behind the, you know, a wireline or a high speed connection to to extend it if, if that's your plan, which we highly encourage. Uh, and, and if there is one tr other truism, it's that in telecommunications, supply side economics really seems to work. The more you provide, the more people use and more people want. Uh, first example of this was when we were doing dial up, right? So the rest of the world didn't have free local telephone calls. There was a little meter on every, you know, every call. And, and of course, if you were online that way, it was a little small amount, but it was going on. But here it was a free call. And so we were able to connect to the internet. There wasn't much of it, the web at the time, but it didn't cost anything other than your monthly, you know, uh, fee. So people spent an inordinate amount of time just poking around. And, and that created, the, you know, really the demand for broadband that came along after that. So it's just true that, that whatever speed, and I think a couple of people have made the point, whatever speed there is, it tends to fill up and that tends to lead to new things. So right. congratulations again, wonderful on this. It, it, it suggests a question, uh, this connectivity question suggests a question back for, for Bruno and uh, people without connections. Uh, Bruno, are they, are they able to, uh, you've opened up the libraries, it looks like impressively, uh, we, we haven't a few, very few small percentage of libraries are, uh, uh, are open in the U S uh, right now. <clears throat> but the big question is people that don't have connectivity to your book club and the rest of it. Uh, is there a special consideration? They have to come into the library or, or how are you dealing with the people without connections? 
Well, that's quite a challenge, Don. Here in Portugal, when the, all the society closed down, especially for the schools, um, the government started um, a national online program for schools. And one of the aspects that was uh, highlighted was the big amount of children that don't have quality um, internet connection at their homes. So some municipalities tried to help the families um, lending um, uh, some routers and increasing some signals and using some of the mobile libraries in order to put them circulated with the community. But of course, the mobile library can only um, be at one place at the time. So that was quite, quite a challenge for the libraries and for the, the, the public libraries. After the, the reopening, they registered um, a very high demand for access to Wi-Fi signals and access for the uh, computers that are uh, in the libraries. Unfortunately, um, and uh, even s most of the libraries, 97% uh, of the libraries are open uh, since the end of uh, June. Um, but unfortunately, some of the libraries that uh, are open to the public have some restriction, restrictions on using um, uh, services or materials that can be uh, used for different persons. We are now trying to develop some orientations in order to uh, transmit some uh, safe, some safe um, procedures in order for the people can use the computers with no um, strange and rare uh, concerns about uh, contamination. But some of the libraries, uh, all the libraries register a very high demand of the computers and the Wi-Fi signal, yeah. That's that's a great report, uh, and and it's it's kind of what we're seeing uh, is an increase in demand for library services, especially digital services. But uh, if you can get to a physical facility for help, uh, I can see that. Uh, any other questions for Carson and Stephanie? Here we're going to run over a couple of minutes, but this is really interesting. Uh, anyone there? I think you can unmute and just ask a question if you want. Don, are you able to uh, share the chat um, uh, a text with us? Because there was some great feedback and folks uh, uh, offering yeah. to, to stay connected. We summarized this and include it uh, in uh, notes, follow-up notes, uh, which Stephen Weiber so helpfully and effectively summarizes for us as a follow-up uh, mail, and then we pull parts out of this. Uh, and the links are definitely one of those things that people are interested in. So uh, you've provided links yourself, Carson, to the, to the tool, the toolkit, and your excellent video, I must say. Uh, so that's how we kind of do that, rather okay. than copying the entire chat, which you know, That's cool. I'm, I did mean to interrupt, but I didn't want to miss that. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to be geeky. I'm going to make some screenshots. So, uh. <laughs> fine, 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 fine. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So let's see. Anybody for Carson? Carson, ask yourself a question. Um, well, I was going to cheekily say, so how can I get involved? Um, I think um, the question I would ask is, so Carson and Stephanie, how exactly are you going to make this tool, or why is it important to make this toolkit more accessible? It seems like it was popular, right? Um, and I think the answer to that is that we, we understand that the reason it became um, useful is because there was this introduction from a human to another human about the toolkit. When you're a novice, because of the areas that we had to cover with it, when you look at it, it looks kind of intimidating. Now, once you open it up and start working with it, you realize, oh, it's not that bad. But that initial um, um, look at that can be off-putting to a novice or, or a layperson. And so that's one of the areas that we, uh, we want to tackle. We want to make it more accessible so that that entry, there's not a barrier to, to using the information um, because people feel intimidated by the, the way it looks or the amount of information that's there. All right, good. Well, uh, you mentioned, Stephanie, you're putting an advisory group together. Did you want to say more about that? 
Um, just at this point, we're still in the in the forming stages of that, and obviously looking forward to involving everyone who gave us uh, letters of support. But we're not limiting it to that. So if you have connections, if you think you know someone who would be able to help with the project, if you want to help on the project, please reach out. I just put my email address into the chat, and that will also be mine and Carson's contact information is also in the presentation. Great, thank, thank you. you. And it was on the slide uh, and. As, you, as we pointed out, this is being recorded. We will have the recording up usually uh, uh, in a couple of days, and so people can find it there as well. Um, there was a, one question about testing speed. Uh, is, there a, is there a speed test tool in, in, inside of the toolkit, or is there another tool that you recommend for testing the speed of a library? There, there is, and, and we would also like to uh, integrate, uh, if we can, something that another uh, one of our colleagues uh, has done, the Measuring Library Broadband Networks Project, which I, I, I'm not sure if they've been on this show yet, Don, but you're certainly aware of the good work that they've done with uh, measurement devices that give actual um, uh, results, ones that we can actually, that we can trust with certainty is the idea. And that's the idea of a very uh, a low impact small device that's in the library uh, creating uh, measures to a known point on the internet to do that. Um, and I know that Daniel had uh, uh, suggested some, uh, some updated speed test sorts of things. So that's definitely one of those updates that we're going to look at because that, that can be a moving target as well. And as you know, lots of variables involved. If you have a link on that, please post it. Uh, Daniel also makes the excellent point about upload speeds, which is a, a different circumstance now in the, uh, in the pandemic than it used to be. Right. Uh, we'd always talked about, you know, four or five to one ratio of, of down to up. But now as, as people are, are, you know, generating video, broadcasting video, multiple streams of video in the same household, uh, we need much more bandwidth everywhere. Uh, we need symmetrical yeah. bandwidth in libraries minimally, I think. Uh, that's something that, that people have snuck by on. Um, and it, it's just one of those hidden dangers to not have symmetrical bandwidth in any, uh, any sense. With that, though, comes network management, right? When you, when you have a, a good, robust pipe going both directions, then you need to be able to make sure that, you're, uh, uh, that it's safe. It's safe to use and, and, and you're not being compromised and have a way to monitor that and know. Um, those, things are, those are the sorts of things that we struggle with on the technical side of the toolkit because for every simple explanation that you saw, in there, we had deep, deep, deep conversations about what was the most important and then how to express that in a simple way that also wasn't scary, yeah. right? Very good, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Internet Society has a, has a measurement tool. Uh, and, it, and, and just what you said, Carson, and it brings up the wider topic of, you know, what is the Internet uh, and what is the Internet becoming and the, the, the decentralization trend, the the splinter net as it's being called, different varieties of the internet, a topic we will definitely take up here in the future. So we're a little bit over. I think this is a, a good point to uh, end the recording, but before we do, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. Could you unmute everyone, please? Unmute, unmute, unmute. Uh, I'd like to give our, give our uh, presenters a hand, please. This is a great presentation, please. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that'll conclude today. Yeah. I hope you come back next week. We've got an interesting uh, lineup for you. We'll be coming out with that soon. So let's conclude today, uh, today's recording now.